Hi, this is Jack Stanley, and I wanted to talk about voices that are lost to us. You know, since the invention of sound recording, there is this window of time in which many individuals lived, but sadly were never recorded. I think one of the greatest losses of all is there are no commercial recordings of Samuel Langhorne Clemens, i.e. Mark Twain. <laughs> you know, Clemens, or should I just say Mark Twain, was born in 1835, a prolific writer a phenomenal um, user of the American tongue. In fact, he created a lot of how we speak. Never made any commercial recordings. He did make a on-the-spot recording for Bettini, um, talking about a trip that he had made, but that record is long lost. He used a, a, an Edison machine for dictating but he didn't like it. What became of the records? They were probably reused or just thrown away. So we really don't know what Samuel Clemens sounded like. We don't know that, that, that twang of, 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 of vocal mannerism that was his. Now, of course, we have Hal Holbrook today, who has made a career of talking and performing as Mark Twain. The thing is that Hal Holbrook has an idea of what he thinks he sounded like, but he doesn't have an exact idea of what he sounds like. And so what he has done, he has fashioned a voice that fits him well. There was the actor William Gillette, who made a recording and a lecture where he impersonated Mark Twain. Sounds very, very different than what we hear from, like, Holbrook and other people who impersonate Twain. The sad part is, we will never know. We will never understand. We, there's so much of, of Mark Twain that we adore, and we know that his off-the-cuff comments were a hundred times more funny than stuff that he wrote but sadly, that is all kind of lost to us. A lot of people wrote down things that he said, and of course, once again, with Hal Holbrook, he's become an institution, and he has preserved uh, a living twain, you might say. But what a wonderful thing it would have been had he recorded, be it for Edison, or be it for Victor, or be it for Columbia, whomever, whoever might have recorded this wonderful speaker. And so we can imagine, we can think of what it was like, but we cannot truly experience it. This is true with so many individuals who lived in the early part of the 20th century. Now, Mark Twain, Clemens, of course, died in 1910, uh, April 21st to be exact, he wasn't well in 1910 at all, so he couldn't have made recordings, but in 1907, he was in New York City, he could have easily gone to the Edison Recording Labs or the Victor or Columbia Recording Labs, which were all nearby, but never did. I don't know if there was ever a uh, dialogue between them as to do such a thing, but wouldn't it be wonderful? We do have voices of people of that time, of course. You know, we have the wonderful actor Joseph Jefferson, who was born in 1829, which was six years earlier than Twain. He died five years before Twain as well. They both died about the same age. And Joseph Jefferson made recordings for Berliner and also made recordings for Columbia in 1903. Why didn't we get Mark Twain? 
Perhaps Mark Twain didn't like the way his voice sounded on the phonograph. He might have had a prejudice against it. Perhaps he was a little worried that his voice would be captured for all time. And maybe he didn't like that. Maybe he liked the idea of being elusive. Who knows? That's something we will never know. But think of all the other voices that have been lost to us. You know, uh, John Hay, for instance. Now, John Hay, you may not know who he was. But he was someone rather important and was right in the center of many things. He was Abraham Lincoln's assistant secretary during his administration. Now, John Hay lived till 1905, the same year as Joseph Jefferson. Wouldn't it be magnificent to have a recording of John Hay speaking? And perhaps while he spoke, he could talk of Lincoln and perhaps even give us an idea of what Lincoln talked like or what he sounded like, because we have no idea. We can read Lincoln's words, but we can never quite interpret how he said them. That's the wonder of sound recording, because of all of the people that predate recorded sound, we can only surmise. But it's amazing when you hear someone speak, you can hear the inflection, you can hear the emphasis on words. And believe me, in a speech, what is emphasized can be very, very different from what is written on the page. You know, we've got Edwin Booth. He actually made a cylinder. Actually made two cylinders. Now, he formed the Players Club in New York City. It has been my pleasure to be there several times. And, of course, Clemens belonged to the Players Club, as did Joseph Jefferson, as did many great performers, actors, generals, entertainers, businessmen of the late 19th and early 20th century. You know, uh, Mark Twain's, let's just use Mark Twain, it'll be easier, his pool stick is hanging over the mantel at the Players Club, where they used to have the pool table. And, of course, that's where he would play. He loved billiards and, of course, had a grand old time at the Players Club. Joseph Jefferson, of course, ran it after Edwin Booth's death. Now, by the way, an interesting thing. Um, on the top floor of the Players Club is Edwin Booth's room, which is still preserved as it was left. And uh, that's where he died, uh, I believe, 1893, somewhere right around there. And, of course, Joseph Jefferson took over the Players Club as its president until his death in 1905. You can just imagine what it was like there in the 1890s and 1900, perhaps. You know, having this gathering of amazing talent. And just think of the stories that were told. Oh, if those walls could talk. You know, it's an interesting thing. Um, Jason Robards, who would, in 1991, play Samuel Clemens uh, in, a, in a Disney film, uh, he, uh, he used to hang out at the Players Club, too. And years ago, he was quite a notorious drinker which he did overcome, but before that happened, <laughs> in the old days of the Players Club, he got quite wildly drunk and ended up crashing on Edwin Booth's bed. <laughs> it's kind of an interesting story, because no one else used that room, but a few people uh, passed out on that bed, I guess. I'm sure over the years. You know, another thing that's fascinating, too, you know, you had uh, General Sherman. He was part of the Players Club, too. That whole gathering, wouldn't it have been fascinating if someone had brought a phonograph into the Players Club and said, let's make recordings of everybody here. Just think of the rich 
archive of sound that would exist. We don't have that, sadly. And once again, we don't know what Mark Twain sounded like. We don't know what a lot of people sounded like in the early part of the 20th century. We're fortunate to have the voices of some. We think we have the voices of others, but I seriously doubt it. Walt Whitman. Wouldn't it be great to have a real recording of him? Because I really doubt the recording that exists of Walt Whitman is true, original, or real. So I would suggest something to you all. You know, we all make home recordings of our families, perhaps. Probably not often enough. And probably we may, maybe made videotapes years ago. Those are all going away. I would make the suggestion, make recordings of your family, your parents, your kids, your grandparents. Get them to talk about things. Preserve that archive of sound. That's very, very important. And just like we don't know what Mark Twain sounded like, 30 years from now, you're not going to know what your friends really sounded like either, especially if you don't have recordings of them. And so there are painfully few recordings of a lot of people. And I think it's very important to keep that archive and always keep it going because we always need to keep that collection of sound because that archive of sound is the most important thing in the world. It's precious. Not only do we speak differently as time goes on, but we also lose parts of our own identity by not, by not recording. And so, ladies and gentlemen, it's kind of sad we can't hear um, our friend Samuel Langhorn Clemens, or SLC, as he was often called. But we can capture the great writers of today, the great speakers of today, our dear friends, our comrades, our parents, our grandchildren. Always keep that archive alive and going. So we never have a void in our lives or perhaps in our grandchildren's lives. We want to be able to share our time with them and let them share their time with others. That's the wonder of sound recording. It's a very important thing. That's about all I have to say.